بالله زرت المغاني مرة Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to another episode of I Jihad, a web series dedicated to deconstructing anti-Islam polemics while providing our audience with the most accurate information on Islam and the Muslim world. I'm your host, the narrator, and this is my sidekick, Abu Ren. Today we will be analyzing a set of videos from a popular ex-Muslim YouTuber that goes by the name of The Masked Arab. Hey Abu, why don't you fetch me the case file on our next target? Thanks. All right, let's see here. So the masked Arab has gained a large following due to being an ex-Muslim who happens to critique Islam. He is most well known for arguing that ISIS is a near-perfect representation of Islamic teachings. So we intend to examine his videos in depth, revealing their numerous errors and fallacious logic. Admittedly, however, this is going to be quite difficult, because it seems that all one needs to do these days to be granted supreme authority on a religion is to be an ex-follower of that religion. In other words, we are not as privileged as the masked Arab to have these magical powers conferred upon us by the credulous masses. So we'll have to rely on these inconsequential things called facts in order to make our case. Now, to be fair, the masked Arab does attempt to present authentic sources throughout his videos. That said, he does so in a purposefully selective manner, twisting those sources to suit his own agenda so as to deceive his audience. Now, if you don't believe me, that's perfectly fine, because by the end of this episode, you will. You see, we will be using the very same sources as the masked Arab to prove this accusation. That's right, the very same sources, links and all. There will be no mental gymnastics on display here, no excuses and no apologetics. Nope, just some good old reading comprehension and a love for integrity. And as always, we will provide full academic references. Now, in order to do this, we will need to begin by looking at the first two videos of the Masked Arab series on Islam and ISIS. The first video deals with terrorism and extremism, and the second with killing innocent civilians. Now, these two videos are essentially the same. However, what makes them particularly notable is that they are the foundation for the rest of the series. In other words, if significant errors can be found in these videos, then dominoes will fall. As for those of you who may complain about the length of this episode, allow me to invoke Brandolini's Law. The amount of energy needed to refute nonsense is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. So, without further ado, let's begin, shall we? So, let's begin in this video with issue number one. Terrorism and extremism. Here I want to speak about these two issues in the general sense. Terrorism in the Arabic language is Irhab, and it comes from the root word Rahaba. First question, does the Quran order its followers anywhere to use terrorism? The answer is yes. Chapter 8 verse 60 reads, Against them make ready your strength to the utmost of your power, including steeds of war, to strike terror into the hearts of enemies of Allah and your enemies. In Arabic it reads, The word turhibuna here is terrorize. Another root word used in the Quran is ru'ab, which is translated to horror or terror. Chapter 8 verse 12 uses this word in a verse where Allah instructs the believers on how to fight the non-believers in battle. When your Lord revealed to the angels, I am with you, therefore make firm those who believe. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieve. Therefore strike off their heads and strike off every fingertip of them. At the very beginning of the masked Arab's argument, we already have a major problem. However, it's very subtle. In order to explain it, we need to start with the definition of terrorism, which is broadly defined as the unlawful use of violence and intimidation, especially against civilians, 
in the pursuit of political aims. Now, while it is true that the Arabic word for terrorism is Irhab, it is literally impossible for any word in the Qur'an to be representative of this phenomenon. Why? Well, because the word terrorism wasn't coined until the late 18th century during the French Revolution. The term was coined by a political party called the Jacobins, who used it as a self-reference for their own policies. Now, if the problem isn't already obvious, let's get out our trusty logic lamp to make this clearer. In summary, the masked Arab is arguing that because the word terror, or to terrify, is in the Qur'an, this refers specifically to a phenomenon that was coined 11 centuries later. In other words, the masked Arab is trying to apply an 18th century term to a 7th century text. This is absurd, not only for being a blatant anachronism, but because it's logically fallacious. More specifically, the masked Arab has committed the fallacy of equivocation which is using an ambiguous term in more than one sense, thus making an argument misleading. For example, the masked Arab's argument is about as ludicrous as inferring that because the word terror is in the phrase, the global war on terror, this means that there is a global movement to ban scary movies. In a similar fashion, the masked Arab has also committed the etymological fallacy, which is an attempt to derive a definition strictly from the etymology of a term. However, this is not how language works. However, is it still possible that the Qur'an advocates what we now understand to be terrorism? Of course, because this phenomenon has existed well before the term was even coined. That said, one cannot determine this by using such fallacious reasoning. What is needed is an honest examination of the context behind the aforementioned passages. If the context of those passages falls within the definition of terrorism, then the masked Arab would naturally be correct in his analysis. However, Simply terrifying people or being terrified is not an essential aspect of what constitutes terrorism. It is merely a product of this immoral practice. As the political philosopher Igor Primorats elucidates, this targeting of the innocent is the essential trait of terrorism, both conceptually and morally. The belief that innocence implies a far-reaching, though perhaps not absolute immunity, against the infliction of severe harm is a brute fact of the immoral experience of most of us. One may lose this immunity by attacking someone else, or by enlisting in the army in time of war, or by joining security services, or by holding office in a regime or an organization that is resisted by violence because of its unjust or allegedly unjust policies. But one who has done none of the above is innocent of anything that might plausibly be brought up as a justification for a violent attack on said persons, or a threat of such an attack, and is thus immune against it. When a person is attacked nevertheless, with the aim of intimidating someone else and making them do something they otherwise would not do, that is terrorism. Terrorism is different, both conceptually and morally, from violence employed in self-defense, from war in general and guerrilla war in particular, and from political assassination. Thus, in order for the Qur'an to be abdicating terrorism, it needs to be very specific in talking about violence and terror against non-combatants. But is this the case? Well, before going more in depth, let's allow the masked Arab to offer his explanation on the context behind these verses. I'll undoubtedly hear people saying, out of context. So let's look into the context and see what Islam's biggest scholars said about the verses. If we look at the interpretation of this verse from one of Sunni Islam's most reputable commentaries on the Quran, the renowned scholar Ibn Kathir, we find inflicting fear on non-believers is sanctioned in verse 55 of chapter 8, according to Ibn Kathir. Allah states here that the worst moving creatures on the face of the earth are those who disbelieve. So, if you gain the mastery over them in war, if you defeat them and have victory over them in war, then disperse those who are behind them by severely punishing the captured people. This ayah commands punishing them harshly and inflicting casualties on them. This way, other enemies, Arabs and non-Arabs, will be afraid and take a lesson from their end. That, in a nutshell, pretty effectively describes the phenomena of terrorism as we see it in the world today, punishing people harshly in order to frighten others. Here, the masked Arab relies on what is possibly considered one of the most reputable Quranic commentaries in the Muslim world, a tafsir by the 14th century scholar Ibn Kathir. However, the masked Arab's use of this tafsir is rather deceptive, and we need only examine the commentary ourselves to affirm this. First, let's take a look at the Mast Arab's bibliography for this video. As you can see here, he references the tafsir and provides a link, but the commentary he provides is for chapter 8, verse 55, not for the verses he just mentioned prior. 
which were 812 and 860. So not only does he neglect to show the commentary for these verses, but he also neglects to mention the introductory commentary for the entire chapter, or surah. And why is this a problem? Well, because Ibn Kathir openly contradicts the Mast Arab's interpretation of these verses. Going straight to the website the Mast Arab uses, we find the following introductory commentary for this surah. Al-Bukhari recorded that Ibn Abbas said, Al-Anfal are the spoils of war. Al-Bukhari also recorded that Sayyid bin Jubair said, I said to Ibn Abbas, Surat Al-Anfal, he said, it was revealed concerning the battle of Badr. Imam Ahmed recorded that Abu Umama said that Ubada bin As-Samat said, We went with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to the battle of Badr. When the two armies met, Allah defeated the enemy and some of us pursued them, inflicting utter defeat and casualties. From the introductory commentary alone, it's apparent that this entire surah makes zero reference to the phenomenon of terrorism, because it's specifically talking about two opposing armies. In other words, the disbelievers mentioned in 855 concern military combatants only, not some random non-Muslims that just happen to be walking around minding their own business. Now, while we will be discussing the nature and details of this battle in a subsequent episode, for those who wish to argue that because these verses say THE disbelievers, it therefore means ALL disbelievers, allow me to give you a brief lesson on how grammar works. You see, there are these things called definite articles, and they usually refer back to a more specific person, place, or thing. In other words, they don't always refer to a universal subject. For example, if I said that THE Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor during World War II, it would be obvious that I'm not referring to all Japanese people, but specifically the Japanese military during World War II. No one with any semblance of intelligence would think otherwise. Likewise, if I said that the Americans defeated the Germans in World War II, no one would assume I meant every single American or every single German citizen. Such nuance applies even more so to cases of demonstrative and relative pronouns. So, if this is going to be your counter-response, I beg you, please, spare your brain cells. The masked Arab's deceptive use of this commentary becomes even more apparent in the following clip. I'd like to ask any Muslims this question regarding the latter part of this verse. It asks the believers to cast terror into the hearts of infidels and strike off their heads and their fingertips. But which one do you do first? Are you supposed to chop off the head first and then chop off the fingertips? Or do you chop off the fingertips first? Either way, this is horrific and it's straight from the Quran. If you chop off the head first and then go for the fingertips, then you're just mutilating a dead body. If it's done the other way around and you chop off the fingers first and then the head, then you're just torturing people before killing them. What's the purpose here of mutilation or torture? Please explain how you can accept this verse, and which one you think goes first. Then tell us why you think the mutilation or torture is merited. If you want to argue that they're done at the same time, then what's the point of going for the fingertips? What purpose does that serve? Well, that's a lovely question. However, I don't really understand why he's asking his audience to answer it when he has a commentary on hand that he considers to be of the utmost reliability. So, let's read what Ibn Kathir has to say about this verse. Allah's statement, I will cast terror into the hearts of those who have disbelieved, means you, angels, support the believers, strengthen their battle front against their enemies, thus implementing my command to you. I will cast fear, disgrace, and humiliation over those who defied my command and denied my messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Arabi bin Anas said, In the aftermath of Badr, the people used to recognize whomever the angels killed from those whom they killed by the wounds over their necks, fingers, and toes, because those parts had a mark as if they were branded by fire. So if it wasn't already apparent, this verse is not a direct command to Muslims, but to the angels in support of the Muslims during a military conflict. It's even stated in the verse itself. As for the reason for them attacking those particular body parts, it was to show the Muslims that they were being supported by divine intervention. Now, a non-Muslim doesn't have to believe this story if they don't want to. That's perfectly fine. However, to claim that this verse is a command to Muslims to torture and mutilate non-combatants is simply false. Even the secondary interpretation of this verse, which suggests that it may be a command to the Muslims, does not promote any sort of torture or mutilation of non-combatants, but simply states that Muslims aim for every part of their enemies' bodies during, once again, military conflict. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think any civilized ethic of warfare prohibits the targeting of certain body parts during battle. I mean, if all you had was a sword, I also don't think you'd be wary of chopping at your opponent's hands, seeing as that would probably be a very effective tactic. Just saying. And it doesn't take much effort to realize that all this is implying is that Muslims should not hold back in the heat of battle. That's it. It's not asking them to walk up to their enemies, hold them down, and then proceed to amputate specific body parts during battle. To even suggest such a thing would be absolutely ludicrous. Moving on, the masked Arab then attempts to supplement his erroneous interpretations with some narrations from the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Let's see what Muhammad himself said in the most authentic hadiths or sayings attributed to him. Allah's Messenger said, I have been sent with the shortest expressions bearing the widest meanings, and I have been made victorious with terror, cast in the heart of the enemy. In another hadith, he says something similar. The Messenger of Allah said, I have been given superiority over the other prophets in six respects. I have been given words which are concise but comprehensive in meaning. I have been helped by terror in the hearts of the enemies. So there we had several examples of the word terrorism and terrorize being used in Islamic sources. Once again, these statements require the very same context as the previous Quranic verses. If the enemies in question are combatants, as I think has already been established, then this shouldn't startle anyone other than some delusional pacifist. So what does the masked Arab expect Muslims to do during war? What, try to comfort our enemies by handing out flowers and chocolates? Or perhaps we should resort to taunting them like Frenchmen. If you will not show us the grail, we shall take your castle by force. You don't frighten us, English pig dogs. Go and boil your bottom, sons of a silly person. Ah, blow my nose at you, so-called Arthur King. You and all your silly English niggas. <laughs> What a strange person! Moving on, let's look at how the masked Arab defines extremism in the final part of this video. But what about extremism? The word for an extremist is mutashaddid. A variation of this word, ashidda, appears in chapter 48 verse 29 as a command on how to behave with non-Muslims. In the interpretation of this verse by Jalalain, we read the following. Muhammad is the messenger of God, and those who are with him, that is, his companions from among the believers, are hard, tough against the believers, showing them no mercy, but merciful amongst themselves. In chapter 9 verse 123, we find another instruction on how to treat non-Muslims. It tells us, O ye who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are near to you, and let them find harshness in you, and know that Allah is with those who keep their duty unto him. In chapter 5 verse 54 we see this instruction, as explained by Ibn Kathir. Allah will bring a people whom he will love, and they will love him. Humble towards the believers, stern towards the disbelievers. This is the description of the believers, harsh with the disbelievers, merciful and kind to the believers, angry without smiling before the disbelievers, smiling and beaming with pleasure before his believing brother. This isn't entirely correct. You see, unlike English, Arabic has far more ways to say the word extremist and even more ways for it to be understood. While religious extremism can be represented by the word mutashaddid, it generally has a non-violent connotation. You see, the word is derived from the word tashaddud, which has a variety of meanings in and of itself, including but not limited to the following. Forced hardness, firmness, strength, vigor, hardiness, courage, vehemence, severity, strictness, rigor, etc. In other words, while the word may denote an aspect of extremism, it doesn't usually refer to acts of violence. The type of extremist that the master Arab seems to be talking about is someone who reaches or goes beyond the bounds of a moral or ideological standard, and would probably be better represented by the term mutatarof, which is derived from the word tataruf. That aside, the masked Arab once again neglects to show whether these verses are addressing civilians or military combatants. And by this point, I believe he's doing so deliberately. Why? Well, first notice how he no longer relies on Ibn Kathir when attempting to explain Surah 48 verse 29. Rather, he references Imam Suyuti, the 15th to 16th century scholar who co-wrote a more vague commentary by the name of Tafsir al-Jalalain. He then goes on to mention Surah 9 verse 123, but curiously doesn't attach any commentary at all. And then he does something even more peculiar. He mentions Surah 5 verse 54 within Ibn Kathir's tafsir, 
as a supplement to his commentary on Surah 48 verse 29. Yes, that's right. The Mass Arab is quoting a verse within the commentary of another verse. You need only go to the website he uses, select Surah 4829, and then click on the subsequent page to see where he derives this reference. So why does the Mast Arab suddenly decide to use a new reference while censoring Ibn Kathir? Why not be more consistent and at least use the same ever so credible commentary for these specific passages? You know, so as to remain objective? Well, the answer is quite simple because the masked Arab knows that Ibn Kathir contradicts him, and he wants to hide what he has to say on the matter, while still keeping a veneer of objectivity. As a case in point, when we examine Ibn Kathir's commentary on Surah 9 verse 123, we find that he clearly refers to military conflict. O you who believe, fight those of the disbelievers who are close to you, Allah said next, and let them find harshness in you, meaning, let the disbelievers find harshness in you against them in battle. The complete believer is he who is kind to his believing brother and harsh with his disbelieving enemy. And Surah 5 verse 54 is used here as a supplement. And if this wasn't enough, it gets worse. Because the Quran and Ibn Kathir are very, very explicit regarding the treatment of civilians. Something that the mass Arab once again has refused to mention. For example, the Quran states in the following two verses of Surah 60, Allah does not forbid you to deal kindly and justly with anyone who has not fought you for your faith or driven you out of your homes. Allah loves the just. Allah only forbids you to take as allies those who have fought against you for your faith, driven you out of your homes, and helped others to drive you out. Any of you who take them as allies will truly be wrongdoers. Thus, the Quran makes it explicitly clear that the only people who are to be treated with harshness are those who actively persecute the Muslims, fighting them and driving them out from their homes. Now, one may retort that these verses were abrogated by later verses, which seem to advocate all-out war against every single disbeliever, whether they be soldiers or civilians. More specifically, one might mention Surah 9, verse 5. When the four forbidden months are over, wherever you encounter the idolaters, kill them, seize them, besiege them, wait for them at every lookout post. But if they turn to Allah, maintain the prayer, and pay the prescribed alms, let them go on their way, for Allah is most forgiving and merciful. At a later point in this episode, we'll discuss this verse in more detail, but in the meantime, let's address this counter-argument, once again using the masked Arab's very own references. Firstly, it should be noted that neither Ibn Kathir nor Imam Siyuti claim that the two verses in Surah 60 were abrogated. More importantly, however, Ibn Kathir openly states his opposition to the idea that Surah 9 verse 5 abrogates previous passages. He makes this clear in his commentary on Surah 2 190 to 191, where he states the following, And fight in the way of Allah those who fight you. Abu al-Aliyah said, This was the first ayah about fighting that was revealed in al Madinah. Ever since it was revealed, Allah's Messenger وسلم, used to fight only those who fought him and avoid non-combatants. Later, Surah 9 was revealed. Abdurrahman bin Zayd bin Aslam said similarly. Then he said that this was later abrogated by the ayah, then kill them wherever you find them. However, this statement is not plausible. Because Allah's statement, those who fight you, applies only to fighting the enemies who are engaged in fighting Islam and its people. So the ayah means, fight those who fight you. Just as Allah said in another ayah, and fight against the mushrikeen collectively as they fight against you collectively. He then goes on to say, but transgress not the limits. Truly, Allah likes not the transgressors. This ayah means, fight for the sake of Allah and do not be transgressors, such as by committing prohibitions. Al-Hasan al-Basri stated that transgression, indicated by this ayah, includes mutilating the dead, theft from captured goods, killing women, children, and old people who do not participate in warfare, killing priests and residents of houses of worship, burning down trees, and killing animals without real benefit. As such, it should be obvious by this point that the masked Arab isn't acting innocently with these omissions. More formally speaking, what the masked Arab is doing here is committing the fallacy of suppressed evidence, where he has purposefully excluded information to suit his own agenda. This is also commonly referred to as cherry-picking. So, I'd say this is a pretty bad start for such a major expose produced by an apparent authority on the subject. But, can the masked Arab salvage this mess? Well, let's move on to his second video where he argues that Islam condones the killing of innocent civilians.
So let's move on to point number two, killing innocents and civilians. Whenever the issue of killing innocent people comes up, many Muslims will simply throw this verse in your face and expect the problem to go away. On that account, we ordained for the children of Israel that if anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. And if anyone saved the life, it would be as if he saved the life of the whole people. Nearly all the time an apologist shows you this verse, you won't be shown the first part of that verse, as it makes clear that this is an instruction God gave to the Israelites and not the Muslims. They will often also extract a central part of that verse, which tells you that the people can be killed for spreading mischief, whatever that means. But back to the fact that it's not actually directed as an instruction to Muslims, and it's only referring to an instruction given to the Jews. Some might say it doesn't matter, as the instructions for the Israelites are the same for the Muslims. But has the God of the Quran instructed anything to the Israelites that wasn't also instructed to the Muslims? Well, the answer is yes. They were given the Sabbath, and that's confirmed in numerous verses, including one where God punishes those who don't abide by it by turning them into monkeys. But it's clearly commanded to the Jews, as we can see by this verse. We said to them, do not exceed the limits of the Sabbath, and we made with them a firm covenant. So, an instruction to Jews is not always binding on Muslims, and the use of this verse by apologists fails easily at the first hurdle. Well, I'm not familiar with how so-called Islamic apologists use this verse, but I'm pretty sure the verses I would rely on would be the following. For one, the previously mentioned verses in Surah 60. Then, I would probably mention Surah 6, verse 151, which is a direct command to Muslims. Say, come, I will tell you what your Lord has forbidden you. Do not ascribe anything as a partner to him. Be good to your parents. Do not kill your children in fear of poverty. We will provide for you and for them. Stay well away from committing obscenities, whether openly or in secret. Do not take the life Allah has made sacred, except by right. This is what he commands you to do. Perhaps you will use your reason. Subsequently, I then use Ibn Kathir's commentary on this verse, which clarifies what a sacred life is. And kill not anyone whom Allah has forbidden, except for a just cause, according to Islamic law. The blood of a Muslim person who testifies that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, and that I am a messenger of Allah وسلم, is prohibited, except for three offenses. He goes on to say, There is a prohibition, a warning, and a threat against killing the Mu'ahid, i.e. non-Muslims who have a treaty of peace with Muslims. Al-Bukhari recorded that Abdullah bin Amr said that the Prophet wasallam said, Whoever killed a person having a treaty of protection with Muslims shall not smell the scent of paradise, though its scent is perceived from a distance of 40 years. Interestingly enough, the masked Arab doesn't even bother to mention any of these verses or their commentary. How convenient. But let's completely ignore the first part of the verse, as Muslims would probably like us to, as it weakens their argument here. Let's assume for a second that the verse about killing one is like killing humanity is in fact binding for the Muslims. The verse doesn't say you shouldn't kill non-combatants. It gives us conditions where killing people is allowed. If anyone slew a person, unless it be for murder or for spreading mischief in the land, it would be as if he slew the whole people. So this punishment doesn't count if the person you are killing is a murderer or someone committing mischief. So how do Islamic scholars interpret mischief here? Let's first look at Jalalain's commentary for the verse. We decreed for the children of Israel that whoever slays a soul for other than a soul slain or for other than corruption committed in the land in the way of unbelief, fornication or waylaying and the like, it shall be as if he had slain mankind altogether. Our messengers have already come to them, that is, to the children of Israel, with clear proofs, miracles, but after that, many of them still commit excesses in the land, overstepping the bounds through disbelief, killing, and the like. We see here that disbelief is classified as one of the criteria for spreading mischief in the land. So, in other words, only a believing Muslim can be considered innocent, according to this verse. Let's look at another commentary on the verse to see if this idea is supported elsewhere. Ibn Kathir's commentary on the verse reads, he who allows himself to shed the blood of a Muslim is like he who allows shedding the blood of all people. He who forbids shedding the blood of one Muslim is like he who forbids shedding the blood of all people. Wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. Didn't the masked Arab just claim that this verse isn't for Muslims? So why is he now attempting to use commentary to suggest it is for Muslims? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Neither Imam Suyuti nor Ibn Kathir see this verse as being for Muslims. Also, neither of them condone the killing of civilians. 
So how is the masked Arab inferring from this verse that innocent civilians can be killed? Well, once again, the masked Arab is hiding additional information from his viewers. Notice how he focuses on this one line. However, if we visit that same link, we find the primary interpretation of this verse above this line. That if anyone killed a person not in retaliation of murder, or and to spread mischief in the land, it would be as if he killed all mankind, and if anyone saved a life, it would be as if he saved the life of all mankind. The ayah states, Whoever kills a soul without justification, such as in retaliation for murder or for causing mischief in the land, will be as if he has killed all mankind, because there is no difference between one life and another. As for the masked Arab's claim that only a believing Muslim can be considered innocent, this is also false, because, once again, the masked Arab refuses to show what Ibn Kathir actually thought on the matter. Case in point, Ibn Kathir comments only two pages later regarding the treatment of Muslims who make mischief in the land. The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger وسلم, were revealed about the idolaters. Therefore, the ayah decrees that whoever among them repents before you apprehend them, then you have no right to punish them. This ayah does not save a Muslim from punishment. He will still be liable for punishment for the crimes he committed. The correct opinion is that this ayah is general in meaning and includes the idolaters and all others who commit the types of crimes the ayah mentions. Again, the idea that the masked Arab just happened to miss all this information is by this time a ludicrous proposition. Another Quranic verse spells this out more clearly. The distinction is written into the verse here that the murder of a fellow believer is completely unacceptable. It doesn't mention the murder of non-believers here. And that omission speaks volumes. Chapter 4 verse 93 And whoever kills a believer intentionally, his punishment is hell, he shall abide in it. Now, if the Quran wanted to ban the killing of any non-combatant, why not say so? Why place a clause like committing mischief? And when those clauses are not found, the verse clearly only mentions the forbidding of the killing of believers. But the Quran does explicitly forbid the killing of innocent civilians, as we've already seen from all the aforementioned verses and commentaries. The only problem here is that the masked Arab has deliberately refused to mention them. Let's now move on to civilian deaths. Civilian deaths can easily be justified as a means to avenge Muslim civilian deaths with a simple reading of verses we've already covered, like this one. Chapter 16, verse 126. If ye punish, then punish with the like of that wherewith ye were afflicted. But if ye endure patiently, verily it is better for the patient. So this basically gives the green light to retaliate in kind, similar to an eye for an eye. So if Muslims claim that non-believers have been killing their civilians, they can respond in kind. Another verse that appears to be giving such a green light is the verse of retaliation in chapter 2 verse 128. O you who believe, retaliation is prescribed for you in the matter of the slain, the free for the free, and the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. If we read the reason why this verse was revealed, we read the following that gives us the context of its revelation. O ye who believe, retaliation is prescribed for you in the matter of the murdered. Fighting took place between two Arab tribes. One tribe had more power than the other, and therefore they said, For every slave of ours that you kill, we will kill a free man of yours, and for every woman of ours, a man of yours. And then this verse was revealed. So it basically tells us, when two sides are fighting, you can retaliate by killing a person from the opposing side, but only if you kill a free man for a free man, a slave for a slave, or a woman for a woman. Instead of banning this barbaric practice of retribution, the author of the Quran endorses it just as long as the person killed in the retaliation is of the perceived equal value of the person who was murdered in the first place. This obviously isn't very fair, as innocent people will be killed here. You would have thought the religion of peace would not tolerate such ancient retribution, and be very clear that only a person guilty of the murder can be punished, regardless of whether he was free, a slave, or whether it was a woman. It's interesting how the masked Arab interprets these passages, but once again refuses to mention any commentary other than a new reference, which simply shows what triggered these verses to begin with. But the problem here is significant. Firstly, these passages were a response to an early Arab cultural practice, where if a person from one tribe was murdered, said tribe would select someone at random from a different social status to take the place of the murderer. Obviously, more powerful tribes would take advantage of this and use it as an excuse to disproportionately kill even more of the opposing tribe's members. This was a horribly barbaric practice. So why does the Qur'an respond in the way it does? 
To answer this, we need only look at the Mast Arab's very own sources again. Taking a look at his bibliography for the second video, we find that he utilizes a commentary from the 13th century scholar of Islamic law, Imam Qurtubi. So let's take a look at that commentary ourselves and see what Imam Qurtubi has to say regarding retaliation, specifically in Surah 2 verse 178. The form that retaliation takes is that when the relative of the victim wants to kill, the killer is obliged to submit to the command of Allah and to accept the prescribed retaliation. The relative of the murdered man is obliged to stop the killer of his relative and not to go beyond him and kill someone else as well, which is what the Arabs used to do before Islam. That is the meaning of the words of the Prophet wasallam. On the day of rising, the most insolent of people towards Allah will be three men. Someone who killed other than the killer, someone who kills in the haram, and someone who acts by the blood feuds of Jahaliya. Asha'abi, Qatata, and others said, the people of the Jahaliya were excessive and obeyed shaitan. When a tribe possessed might and power and a slave of theirs was killed by the slave of another person, they said, we will only kill a free person for him. If a woman of theirs was killed, they said, we will only kill a man for her. When a base person among them was killed, they said, we will only kill a noble for them. They said, killing safeguards against killing. But Allah forbade them transgression in this ayat and others. This was to refute the Arabs who wanted to kill someone who was not the killer for someone who had been killed and to kill a hundred innocent people in retaliation for one or to take advantage of rank and power. Therefore, Allah commanded fairness and equality, so that only those who kill are killed. In other words, this directly contradicts the masked Arabs' argument that innocent civilians are allowed to be killed in retaliation. Once again, his own reference refutes him. How quaint. That said, let's discuss retaliation in more detail after examining the following clip. We see in this authentic narration by Muhammad that Muslims who murder non-Muslims are not to be punished as murderers. The Messenger of Allah said, a Muslim should not be killed in retaliation for the murder of a disbeliever. Yes, retaliation, or kisas, is not allowed against a Muslim who murders a non-believer. The reason being is because retaliation was only sanctioned to settle civil disputes between Muslims. However, that doesn't mean that a Muslim who murders an innocent non-believer isn't punished at all. You see, there are other forms of punishment in Islam other than Kisas. Kisas merely entails private retaliation by a victim's family against the murderer. However, there is also Ta'zir, which is a punishment decided by a judge when there is no explicit ruling from the Quran or Sunnah. In other words, the murder of a non-believer by a Muslim is directly handled by the state and not the victim's family. That said, some scholars, particularly from the Hanafi Madhab, did allow for Qisas to be enacted when a Muslim murdered a non-Muslim. This was due to the fact that they interpreted the aforementioned hadith as only referring to combatants. Once again, Imam Qurtubi clarifies the matter for us in his commentary on Surah 2 verse 178. The Kufans, or Hanafi scholars, say that a free man is killed if he has killed a slave and a Muslim if he has killed a dhimmi, or protected non-Muslim. They said that the blood of a dhimmi has the same inviolability as that of a Muslim and should be satisfied by retaliation. It is the inviolability of blood which is the principle. Both the Muslim and the dhimmi are the people of the abode of Islam. The thing which verifies that is the fact that a Muslim's hand is cut off for stealing the property of a dhimmi, which indicates that the property of a dhimmi is the same as that of a Muslim. It follows then that their blood must be the same as well. So while someone may object to the way in which punishments are meted out in Islam, it is simply false to claim that a Muslim is immune from punishment if he or she murders a non-Muslim civilian. Moving on. Now let's look at another question. Can a Muslim kill a non-Muslim in normal circumstances where there isn't a war going on? Page 496 of the Qurtubi Tafsir in English, 4 chapter 2 verse 193, reads the following. Fight them until there is no more fitna and the deen belongs to Allah alone. If they cease, there should be no enmity towards any but wrongdoers. This is a command to fight every idolater in every place according to those who say that it abrogates the previous ayats. According to those who say that it does not abrogate other ayats, it means fight those above whom Allah says, if they fight you. The former is the more likely meaning. It is an unqualified command to fight without any precondition of hostilities being initiated by the unbelievers. The evidence for that is in the words of Allah and the deen belongs to Allah alone. 
This has spelt it out for us very clearly that the verse has been understood to command Muslims to fight every idolater in every place as the most likely meaning. It adds that fighting non-believers can occur without the non-believers initiating or starting a fight against the Muslims. Then it reads, so the goal is to abolish this belief and that is clear. In the commentary by Qurtubi again for chapter 4 verse 94 this time, we read the following. If a Muslim met an infidel who has not been offered protection, he can kill him. But if he says there is no God but Allah, he can no longer be killed because as a Muslim, his blood can no longer be shed. So here we finally get to see the masked Arab use Imam Qurtubi to support his claim that Islam allows for the deliberate killing of civilians. As you've seen earlier, Imam Qurtubi disagrees with Ibn Kathir regarding the abrogation of certain passages. However, such a disagreement is in the details. Details which the masked Arab has yet again refused to mention. You see, while Imam Qurtubi disagrees with Ibn Kathir regarding abrogation, he still believes that killing civilians is prohibited. Only six pages earlier to the one the masked Arab references, he explains that said abrogation does not allow for the killing of certain groups of people. The Prophet وسلم, fought those who fought him and refrained from those who refrained from fighting him until the ayat in Surat al-Tawbah was revealed. Fight the idolaters wherever you find them. And this ayat, 2190, was abrogated. This is the position of the majority of scholars. Ibn Abbas, Omar Abdulaziz, and Mujahid said that it is an ayat whose judgment remains operative and means fight those who fight you and do not transgress by killing women, children, monks, and the like, as will be explained. An-Nahas said that this is the sounder position in terms of both the Sunnah and in terms of logic. As for the Sunnah, there is a hadith reported by Ibn Umar that during one of the expeditions of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, a woman had been killed and he abhorred that and forbade the killing of women and children. As for logic, it applies to children and those like them, like monks, the chronically ill, old men and hirelings who clearly should not be killed. So even though Imam Qurtubi accepts Surah 9 verse 5 as having abrogated all previous verses, he believes that the prohibition of killing non-combatants is still operative. In other words, he is only advocating for preemptive war. Now, to explain the reasoning behind Surah 9 verse 5 abrogating all previous verses, we can refer back to Ibn Kathir for some historical context. Allah mentions the wisdom in dissolving all obligations to the idolaters and giving them a four-month period of safety, after which they will meet the sharp sword wherever they are found. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, and the Muslims preserved the terms of the treaty with the people of Mecca until the Quraysh broke it and helped their allies, Banu Bakr, against Khuza'ar, the allies of Allah's Messenger Aided by the Quraysh, Banu Bakr killed some of Bani Khuza'ar in the sacred area. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, then led an invasion army in the month of Ramadan of the eighth year and Allah opened the sacred area for him to rule over. In summary, the Muslims and the pagans had a peace treaty and weren't fighting each other until the latter decided to attack and kill the allies of the Muslims. This is what prompted the abrogation to occur, ending the conditional obligation to fight only when directly attacked. Now, whether this injunction was just meant for the idolaters of Mecca or for all time will be discussed in a subsequent episode, but at this point there should be no longer any doubt that Imam Qurtubi does not support the masked Arab's argument regarding killing civilians. We see this authentic hadith that really makes it obvious that Islam was aggressively spreading by the sword and threatening non-Muslims to either convert, pay the jizya, or be killed. But it was also threatening Muslims who weren't good enough in his eyes. Allah's Messenger said, I have been ordered by Allah to fight against the people until they testify that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and that Muhammad is Allah's Messenger, and offer the prayers perfectly and give the obligatory charity. So if they perform that, then they save their lives and property from me. Here he says clearly he has been ordered to fight against the people, referring to them in a general sense, unless they become Muslims, which still isn't enough. They also need to offer prayers perfectly and pay zakat to the state and only then will their lives and property be safe from Muhammad. Remember that grammar lesson I gave on definite articles? Good, because it especially applies here. The people is specific, not general. In any case, given what we already know regarding the pagan Arabs, these ahadiths should not be surprising in the least. You see, when you win a war against an overly aggressive enemy that refuses to abide by peace treaties, it's only rational that you have the privilege of dictating the terms of governance. This is nothing new. It has been practiced throughout the entire history of mankind. 
you would have to be completely bereft of sense to think this was wrong. What's ironic about all this, however, is that while the masked Arab claims that Islam promotes terrorism and extremism, all of his own sources have thus far shown that it was the pagan Arabs and their allies, not the Muslims, who were engaging in mafia-like tactics. So much so that the Muslims eventually had to conquer them completely because they just wouldn't stop. After so many treaties and second chances, the pagans and their allies continued to kill innocent people and persecute the Muslims. When it finally came down to it, the only way to stop them was to force them to submit to Islamic rule, or destroy them completely. There were no other options. Now, I will discuss the context behind these demands in the next episode, so that my viewers will realize the full extent of the crimes committed by the enemies of Islam during this period. However, in the meantime, allow me to give a modern example of this sort of unconditional surrender. At the end of World War II, when the Allied powers finally defeated Japan, they forced them to unconditionally surrender to their terms. This was known as the Potsdam Declaration, and it included, among other terms, the complete abolition of the cult of the God Emperor and his authority, the imposition of democracy on the Japanese people, and the absolute decommissioning of all military forces. And what was the alternative? Yes, that's right, utter destruction. And this is just one example of such a practice. Throughout history, similar forms of unconditional surrender have been made, especially when dealing with aggressive, warmongering societies that absolutely refuse to live peacefully with others. And to drive this point home, allow me to ask a simple question. Would anyone rationally oppose such terms if they were applied to a group like, say, ISIS? Would anyone expect anything less from a civilized society when dealing with such barbarians? I didn't think so. But in fairness, Islam appears to forbid the killing of certain categories of non-Muslims. Those who are paying the jizya tax and living in the Islamic State as lesser subjects, and also those who have been offered protection on a more temporary basis, like messengers from neighboring kingdoms, for example. It appears also that there's a general consensus with classical scholars that prohibits the deliberate targeting of women and children. This is mainly because of this hadith. During some of the ghazawat of Allah's messenger, a woman was found killed, so Allah's messenger forbade the killing of women and children. And by his very own admission, the masked Arab completely undermines his first two videos. Because if it's prohibited in Islam to target and kill disbelieving civilians, such as those whom the Muslims have treaties with, as well as women, the elderly, the sick and disabled, monks, children, and the like, then the proposition that Islam advocates terrorism and extremism is demonstrably false. To say otherwise would be logically incoherent. That said, despite this admission, the masked Arab still attempts to sneak in some final red herrings to further strengthen his poor arguments. We also see this distinction of not killing children in the story of Banu Huraiza, which I'll talk about a bit more later. But generally, the Muslims decided to kill all men and boys above the age of puberty of this particular Jewish tribe they had besieged and starved for several weeks. It was the third and final Jewish tribe of Medina that Muhammad had turned against. The sons of Quraidah told me that they were presented to the Messenger of Allah on the day of Quraidah, and whoever among them had reached puberty or had grown pubic hair was killed, and whoever had not reached puberty and had not grown pubic hair was left alive. As we can see, as with every single other hadith that will be used in this video, this is classified authentic. So many Muslims will probably try to excuse this massacre by claiming that the Jews deserved what they got because they were allegedly treacherous to Muhammad. While evidence of treachery is very flimsy to say the least, even if we were to accept that apologist argument, we know that all the men of the tribe were killed, along with all the boys who had grown pubic hair. If only those guilty of treachery were executed, then why did they even bother to check for pubic hair? Surely if they were punishing based purely on whether an individual was guilty or not, they wouldn't need to be asking little boys to pull their pants down. Well, since the masked Arab is willing to accept for the sake of argument that the Banu Qureda were treacherous, we will only address his concern regarding male teenagers being killed. For some quick background into these events, let's take a look at some authentic ahadith which summarize what happened. Narrated Ibn Omar, Bani An-Nadir and Bani Qureda fought against the Prophet wasallam, violating their peace treaty. So the Prophet wasallam, exiled Bani An-Nadir and allowed Bani Qureda to remain at their places in Medina taking nothing from them till they fought against the Prophet wasallam again. He then killed their men and distributed their women, children, and property among the Muslims, but some of them came to the Prophet wasallam and he granted them safety, and they embraced Islam. He then exiled all Jews from Medina. 
So the first thing we should notice here is that the Jews of Bani Qurayda, along with another Jewish tribe, had agreed to a peace treaty with the Muslims prior and then violated that agreement through their own act of military aggression. After this, the Prophet وسلم, exiled one of the tribes but gave the Bani Qurayda a second chance. Then the Bani Qurayda betrayed the Muslims again, which instigated this punishment. Thus, we can already affirm that this was a second chance given to an obviously very aggressive group of people. However, even then, the Hadith clearly states that some of these people were granted safety, spared, and then converted to Islam as a result. So obviously, not all of the men were killed. Now, let's see how and why this punishment was decided. The people of Banu Qurayda agreed to accept the verdict of Sa'ad bin Mu'ad, an ex-Jew. So the Prophet ﷺ sent for Sa'ad. Then the Prophet ﷺ said to Sa'ad, These, i.e. the Banu Qurayda, have agreed to accept your verdict. Then Sa'ad said, Kill their warriors and take their offspring as captives. Now, according to this hadith, the Banu Qurayda chose Sa'ad to judge their fate, not the Prophet ﷺ, but an ex-Jew who converted to Islam. So they trusted Sa'ad to be fair, assuming that he would probably judge them by their own laws. And indeed, he did just that. And we know this because his judgment was taken from the Torah itself. Quoting Deuteronomy 20, 10-14, If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. In other words, the Banu Qurayda were judged according to their own laws that they themselves agreed to. Anyone who didn't agree to these laws and found them absurd, made the rational decision and converted to Islam. You know, because there is no compulsion in religion. But there's something else interesting about this second hadith in that it makes explicit that only the warriors of the tribe were to be killed. The hadith prior to this also mentions that these warriors were men, not boys. And do you know why? Well, it has something to do with the fact that 1400 years ago, people considered puberty to be the standard for adulthood. And that's perfectly reasonable considering that people back then started life a lot earlier than we do today, mostly because the average life expectancy was far lower than our own. This is not even a remotely controversial point. This is merely common sense. So the fact that the mass Arab thinks that 1400 years ago, teenagers were somehow not treacherous because they were teenagers, is an anachronism which makes evident that he is ignorant of history and human evolutionary development. But that's not entirely surprising. Moving on. So it appears generally at least that killing women and pre-puberty children is forbidden. But in true Islamic fashion, the message gets blurred. And we also have other narrations on this topic which give us scenarios that permit their killing. This narration is in Sahih Muslim, book 32, and the chapter itself is called Permissibility of Killing Women and Children in Night Raids So Long as It Is Not Done Deliberately. The Prophet of Allah, when asked about the women and children of the polytheists being killed during the night raid, said, They are from them. So here, he clearly allowed women and children to be killed if they were what is regarded today as collateral damage. When militants kill people indiscriminately by shooting or bombings, many innocent people, even by jihadi standards of who is deemed innocent, are inevitably killed. So how is this justified? You'll hear the militants say they are attacking a group of people which include what they regard as legitimate targets. Any innocents killed will just go to heaven earlier. This sick mentality is taken direct from this hadith. Allah's Messenger said, An army will invade the Kaaba, and when the invaders reach al bayda all the ground will sink and swallow the whole army. I said, O oh Allah's Messenger, how will they sink into the ground while amongst them will be their markets, the people who worked in business and not invaders, and the people not belonging to them? The Prophet replied, All of those people will sink, but they will be resurrected and judged according to their intentions. So Muhammad basically says even those caught up in the death and destruction who are innocent will just die and be judged by God. Pretty much like how Noah's flood worked, I guess. Finally, the masked Arab makes his last desperate attempt to show that Islam is supportive of deliberately killing civilians based on the non-deliberate killing of civilians. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think any civilized society rejects the concept of collateral damage, especially when it can't be helped. That said, military combatants should do their best to avoid causing collateral damage. 
And I think an argument can be made that any society that doesn't do this is clearly immoral. But to claim that collateral damage in and of itself is immoral, only by virtue of the fact that Islam allows for it, is really grasping at straws. You see, night raids were a common tactic by every civilization in the past, and still are. They were especially effective when facing off against a superior force. Unfortunately, as a result of lacking things like night vision, such collateral damage could not be helped. It's not like today where we have the technology to precisely target soldiers in the dark. So as far as I'm concerned, this objection just puts the final nail in the coffin. Even when he's not cherry-picking, the masked Arab struggles to make a good point. Now, before wrapping up this episode, I'd like to give a closing analysis. You see, it's one thing to be completely wrong about your views, but it's another to be wrong because you don't have enough integrity to address the source material objectively. At this point, it is literally impossible for me to give the benefit of the doubt to the masked Arab. That he's been somehow completely unaware of all this information that contradicts his claims. Especially when it comes from the very same sources he uses to support his own arguments. I just cannot fathom how a practicing Muslim of over 30 years, who claims to have studied the subject in depth, could commit such obvious errors. The dishonesty is palpable. It's as though his use of these sources was merely a smokescreen. You see, I believe the masked Arab knows that his audience isn't going to check his references. He knows that by playing the ex-Muslim card, those in need of a noble savage to reassure them of the superiority of Western civilization will gladly make him an idol of unquestionable authority. And what really makes evident the masked Arab's audacious lack of integrity is when I asked him the following on Twitter. Curious if you'd be willing to retract your ISIS videos if shown to be wrong and issue an apology to your viewers. Seriously. Shortly thereafter, I received a response from the masked Arab, but it wasn't what I was expecting. If you or anyone can prove that every single thing I said in the series is objectively wrong, I'll delete the entire channel. Good luck. You see, a man of integrity would have responded by saying something like, Yes, I will retract my views and issue an apology if I'm shown to be wrong. But instead, the Master Arab decides to do something else. He moves the goalpost, stating that he will only act if absolutely everything he says in the series is refuted. And if he does act, he won't retract his views or issue an apology. Oh no no no. Rather, he will simply run away like a coward by deleting his entire channel. This is nothing less than deplorable. And this is also why I believe that the masked Arab isn't really interested in helping the world get rid of ISIS. No, his only concern is rationalizing his own apostasy. Those mob fools want you gone so they can get back to the way things were. But I know the truth. There's no going back. You've changed things. Forever. Then why do you want to kill me? I don't want to kill you. What would I do without you? Go back to ripping off mob dealers? No, 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 you, you complete me. With all that said, I'd like to thank my viewers for watching. In the next episode of iJihad, we'll be deconstructing another set of videos by the masked Arab. Until then, Jazakallah khaira, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Shaka, wa ummi ya ummi ka
جفاك بكاء فدين كيعلو وكل هورا وعرض استبيحا وما من رجاء سوى بإلهي مجيب الدعاء رضيع تمزق صوت الإباء فكل يردد صوت الغنى وليلة تصيح بكم دنس كرامتكم أيها الأغبياء لساني سليم وقلبي كليم وعيني صارت كفي السقاء أئن طويلا وما من دواء فقومي يصاروا كما الببغاء لساني سليم وقلبي كليم وعيني صارت كفي السقاء أئن طويلا وما من دواء فقومي يصاروا كما الببغاء فهل حلول تعين السريبا وأين الصمود وأين الإباء ونحن ننام كأهل الرقيب وفي غفلة قد يحل البلاء وأرجو الإله يزيل العناء ويرسل جندا كديم السماء ليعلو الكتاب ويخبو سواه وينصر جندا ألح الدعاء ليعلو الكتاب ويخبو سواه وينصر جندا ألح الدعاء